Hello, my name is Gareth Machin and I'm the Artistic Director of Wiltshire Creative. And as part of our Wiltshire Creative Connects Artist Development Programme, I am delighted today to be able to introduce our casting associate, Gabrielle Dawes. Gabrielle, hello, welcome. Hi, Gareth, how are you? I'm very well. Um, I guess we have to acknowledge the extraordinary times we're meeting in and the extraordinary place we're meeting in the the zoom room yes absolutely as i as i said to somebody yesterday up until two months ago i thought zoom was an ice lolly um but now <laughs> here we are um yeah I... no, it's uh, uh yeah challenging and very difficult times for everybody and this is just fantastic that there's the opportunity through things like this to still connect with audiences and talk about what it is we love to do. So, you know, it's, it's really good. Great. Well, obviously as part of my introduction, I, I talked about you as our casting associate, which is obviously slightly different from being a casting director. And I wonder if just a good starting point is just, just talking about the difference between those, those two different roles. Sure. Well, I mean, being a freelance casting director um, is, is you're a casting director for hire. You get approached by producers or directors do you want to cast their play? It could be for the West End. It could be for any one of the regional theatres. It could be for a touring company. Um, it, uh, and if you want to do it, um, you know, you work with the director and the product and the producers and the writer, if, if there's a, if it's a living writer on casting the whole play. Um, and then once that's done, that's done. That's your job done on that one. You go on to the next, um, or you're doing several at the same time, um, which is fantastic. Um, and, uh, but running, but what's so brilliant about working with theatres as a casting associate, and this is the second time I've done it. I was casting associate at Chichester Festival Theatre for 10 years. and. We've now been, we're into our second year of, of working together as, as me as your casting associate with uh, Wiltshire Creative and Salisbury Playhouse. Is that um, you, you cast some of the plays as well, just like any casting director, but also it's the, it's, it's, it's a different level of conversation and it's being in the conversation and being, as it were, in the room with conversations with people like you, the artistic directors and, and about what, what, what plays you might programme in your season um mo most specifically obviously where casting is the thing that would make the play be the play that you would choose over another play um and going out and you know having conversations with agents and of leading actors and 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 um it, it, it put putting together uh, a potential package where an actor might come and do a play which makes the play the play you're going to do and those that, that those conversations about programming and planning um a, a, and a kind of deeper involvement with the organization that you're working with really than 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 just casting a play and moving on is is deeply satisfying and um uh, you know I, I hugely enjoy it i mean you, you're touching upon it now but i mean there are so many different elements to your role, both as casting associate and casting director. I mean, what, what are the things that you enjoy the most? What, what would you love about this job? Um, the variety. I mean, of course, the, the, the task of, of directing the casting process um, is the same, project to project broadly, um, but every team is different. Every director is different. Um, uh, you know, you might work with with on the same play in in the course of your career twice and it'd be totally different because the director's got one the one director of the production has got one way of seeing how he wants or she wants to do it the other director sees it completely differently and that will obviously influence the the, the casting choices the kinds of casting conversations you're having uh, the producers are, you know, highly individual and all, all very different. And, and, and if, again, if you're working with a living writer and they're, they're very much in the conversation as well. So every, every, every job has its own particular flavor, if you like. And, and, and that's what makes it, uh, you know, lively, entertaining, challenging, um, and very uh, satisfying uh, ultimately to, to, to work on. 
And, you know, I love, one of my favourite bits of the job is giving an actor a job, ringing up their agent or ringing them up directly if they don't have an agent and saying, we'd love you to do this. And that's fantastic. And it's even more fantastic when they say yes. Um, so, yeah, it's, and I, you know, I, I love the process of putting actors uh, together with directors in roles and, 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 and seeing what comes out of that. Because of course, we often say goodbye to them on the first day of rehearsals. There's this thing called a meet and greet, as you know, where the creative team, the people who've been working on the production turn up on day one of rehearsals to say hello to everybody and everybody introduces themselves. And then we maybe stay for the read through and then we all go. And then it's the actors and the director who spend four weeks in the rehearsal room giving life to the show. And then you come back and you, when you see it and you see what they've created, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's that, I love that aspect of it as well. Great. And I thought it'd be interesting maybe to talk through the, the casting process. And just before the lockdown happened, you and I had been working on a production of Hay Fever, which sadly uh, hasn't happened yet on the, one of the casualties of, of the lockdown, but maybe, maybe referring to that, that particular process, just talking through how how you start and how you finish well when you know which play it is you're going to be working on I th the, the first thing i want to do is have a conversation with the director which in the case of hay fever was you um a, an in-depth conversation about how you see the play um how you see the each particular role and go through that in some detail so that i'm getting a good picture of where you're coming from and you know what's so satisfying is when you're working with director who you know will allow you know make space for you to not just make suggestions about actors but maybe suggest other ways of seeing uh, the role or or uh, think of a group of actors who perhaps might not originally have been necessarily uh, thought of for it and ex and then you uh, then you draw up lists you go away and you draw up lists for the leading parts um lists of usually known actors actors who are of sufficient experience and uh stature to play a leading role and to to lead a company and to to you know to, to lead a show on a big stage um and then we would go through those names you and i and we would you'd say well let's take him off her or her off him off let's put him in him on her on him on then we kind of shape that list and then I do the availabilities which is calling the agents giving them the dates of the show including the rehearsal dates to first of all just find out who of the people we might be interested in are even free and then we come back we go through that we hone it again and then in dialogue we uh, come to a you know maybe a top four or five of the first people you'd like to go to for that part and then you work through them you, you go make the offer to the first one try and engage the agent as much as possible in getting excited about the project uh, offer up a conversation if the actor and director haven't previously met can we get them together talk about the show talk about how they both see it um, start you know encouraging the beginning of a dialogue or a relationship um, and then you, you know, the actor either is interested and says yes, or if they're not interested or they can't say yes, because for a variety of reasons, they're waiting on a TV job or they've got some reason they can't leave home at the moment. You move on to the next and you just, you just keep working through that list of people. Um, and then, you know, uh, see where you get to. And then obviously you make a decision about which part you're going to cast first part or parts you're going to cast first and then build a company around them because obviously you want you know if someone's playing the husband of the wife for example we wanted to know who was going to be playing Judith Bliss before we wanted to cast the husband role in Hay Fever because you want to balance them well you want to match them well you want to cast them well together so that's the, the leads but then for the wider company um and we did this particularly with the younger parts, but we did them with, with, with quite a few of the parts in Havia, is I would write a breakdown, what's called a casting breakdown, based upon my conversation with you about how you see the parts. 
I put that out to agents and actors uh, through mainly through a, an industry wide uh, platform called Spotlight. Um, and those agents make lots of suggestions. I mean, it could be hundreds and hundreds of suggestions across five or six parts onto the platform. And then I go through them and I make a cut um, choosing. It's, it's my job, part of my job to, to select who I think uh, looks right for what we're looking for. And then you build short lists and you share them with the director. You then um, set your audition days, set up auditions for decide with the director in advance which parts you're going to audition for on a particular day, ask the director what it is the actor should prepare because it's incredibly important that the actor you know, they have 20 minutes, 25 minutes with the director. It's their one, it's their only opportunity on that show. And so I want to make sure that they've got everything they need to give them the best chance of doing their best work in that 20, 25 minute slot. So they need to know where they're going. They need to know who they're meeting. They need to know what time they need to be there. They need to know what to prepare. They need to know what accent to prepare it in. And any other additional information about the show that we have at that time and, the, you know, a reiteration of the dates of the show, the terms of the show, if we can, so that we know that everybody who's coming in has got the information they need to know that they're interested in the job. If they were to get it, they would like to be in it um, and that they are furnished with enough information to do their best work in that audition. And then we might see what sit between it, it diff, differs, but between six and 10 people per part um, over the course of a set of audition days. And then at the end of auditions, you and I will talk through who you liked, who you particularly like, who you maybe need to see again to do a bit more work with them. And then we will start to make offers. And again, wait to see who accepts. Hopefully people who've come in accept, not always can they because they're going in for other jobs too and somebody might come through quicker than you know before we do or um or so their circumstances might change so then we move on to our second choice and it's it's so it's, it's like a jigsaw puzzle really it's putting together different approaches for for different parts of the play the leads the wider company um and and but you're putting together a picture um you, you're balancing hopefully a cast um and and you know it it's very satisfying when it works when it when it works that's great it's a really clear um story of, of the whole casting process um we uh asked people to to send in questions and one of the the questions uh from luke who is a gsa actor musician student he he had a question about the the audition process. He, he asked, is there a general kind of audition process and what do you look for most during that process? Well, I think the shape of an audition process is, uh, you know, they get their, their allotted slot um, and um, they come in, to, they meet the team in the room. There's usually, um, I usually, I don't actually have to encourage directors to, they usually want to do it, but I think it's quite important to spend the first five minutes or so them chatting the director and the actor, because that's how the director starts to get a sense of them as a person, starts to get a sense of whether they think they'd be a good company member, whether they're going to like being in a rehearsal room with them, get, getting a, getting a, starting to get to know them a bit and then go into the reading um, of the scene that they've been asked to prepare um, often the casting director will read in with that person. And, uh, you know, when, when one's doing that, you're always just trying to make sure that you're just, you're, you're, you're delivering a, a level of, uh, delivering a level of energy and the lines to them, but in a way that is in no way distracting to them. And you're servicing their um, opportunity to, to play their, the scene from their character's perspective. Um, then at the end of that, the director may say, right, that's great, I enjoyed those choices, let's talk about that, um, but what I'd love you to do, let's, let's try it again, maybe from a different perspective, not because the first choice wasn't good or right or effective, but 
because the director wants to see whether or not the actor can take notes. So by asking the actor to try it a different way, that's the opportunity for the director to see whether the actor is flexible, whether the actor is responsive um, and, 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 and open to an alternative suggestion to playing a scene to how they perhaps initially thought, thought they might. Um, you're going to have to give me the second part of the question because I've forgotten what it was. <laughs> um, well, I, the, the second part was about what, what, you, what do you look for during the audition process? Um, suitability to role, obviously. Talent, obviously. Are they watchable? Are you excited by their performance? Are they making interesting choices? But also, it's terribly important good company members, people who are not going to be tricky in a rehearsal room, particularly if they're playing a smaller character. Uh, you know, the last thing the director needs is somebody sucking the energy out of the room with them when actually the director's got other bigger roles to concentrate more of their time on. So yeah, it's, it's, um, and, and also, you know, what is the skill set that's required in that role? If it's a show where it's an actor musician show or they're going to have to do puppetry or there's any physical elements to the performing that they may have to be able to deliver. Can they demonstrate that? Do they, do they look like they can be very adaptable? It's so you're, you're, you're getting a sense of whether or not you, you think, they're going to be good in a cast, um, deliver on what's needed from them in the show. Um, and uh, those are the things you're looking for, really, I think. Great. And obviously you, you talk about the, um, the reading of material from the, from the play. And I know in, in most of the auditions that, that we've done, we certainly send out material beforehand to give people plenty of time to look at it. Are there ever any circumstances where you don't send material out? We had a question about audition pieces, and I, I can't think that I, I've ever asked anybody to, to just come in with an audition piece, a, a, a speech, but perhaps, perhaps you know differently. No, I think in, uh, in 22 years, there's only one director that I've ever worked under who um, uh, just actively didn't want the, and he's very um, established, extremely established director, uh, who didn't want them to read from the play. He wanted them to bring in uh, Shakespeare or whatever uh, speech. Um, but in, in, in every other circumstance, particularly with uh, plays as opposed to musicals, in every other circumstance that I can remember, it's always about wanting them to read from the play. Um, you know, we found with hay fever, it was terribly important that the actors we were seeing for Sorrel and Simon, you know, could find the humour and the wit and the pace and the timing and the language. And you've got to, they've got to be able to demonstrate that in an audition. And the people that we found absolutely, absolutely did. Um, but you've got to hear it. You've got to see it. And um, so 99.9% .9 of the time, in my experience, uh, the material from the, and we are talking about theatre now, um, as opposed to any other medium, but um, it, 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 we send out the material. The only possible uh, caveat to that would be if you're doing a big musical, um, particularly if it's a very dancer heavy musical, like there's a big dance ensemble and um, like when we did Singing in the Rain is what I'm thinking about. When we did Singing in the Rain at Chichester that, that then went to the West End. There's a big dance ensemble in, in Singing in the Rain. But, but because of the nature of Singing in the Rain, all, there are also lots and lots of tiny little cameo characters that that dance ensemble will get to play. So they'll all like have a line here or a line there as a bellboy or as a film director or as somebody walking along the street or whatever it is. So you do need to test the acting as well. So once they've done the dance audition and then the singing audition, the acting audition, often there, isn't, there aren't enough lines in the script to run together for them to have a chunk, a good chunk to read. So you've got two choices in that situation. You either give them the material for a, 
a bigger character that they might understudy and ask them to prepare, prepare that material from the show. Or you might ask them to do a monologue. That, that's really the only circumstances in, in which I can think that you would ask them to bring in a, mon a, a, a pre-prepared monologue that's not to do with the material. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And I suppose, I suppose musicals are slightly different as well because often um, actors will bring in a choice of songs that they will know. And, and you, rarely, certainly in first round auditions, would you send out a song for somebody to learn you you'd probably they'd probably come in and offer you a range of their their catalog and and you choose what you wanted to listen to you might give guidance you might say we want to hear a rock ballad or a you know a, a musical comedy number or whatever but i suppose that that's a circumstance where pre-prepared work is 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 useful um we also had a, a question uh, it's an actor musician question about whether if it is an act musician show, you would prefer to see all of the different instruments that somebody plays or just their main instrument? Uh, again, I think it's, it's, it's dependent on the project and it's dependent on what the director and the MD at that point, the musical director, uh, want and need to see and hear in order to feel they can make the casting decisions. So thinking back to a show I did recently um, uh, that was a... Uh, that had a, uh, an actor musician in it, uh, a new version of Christmas Carol. And I think we invited them in. We, we knew what we were looking, we were looking for a range of different instruments, but that didn't all have to come from the same person. So we, I made sure that the people that we had coming in covered that range of instruments. And then we might ask them to bring in, if they were handheld instruments, we might ask them to bring in two um, uh, and then talk to them about their, like the, like the two most important, the two that we knew that they were going to be contributing to the show most through. And then if we knew that we might want them to have, be able to do a bit of percussion or a little bit of keyboards and could see from their CV because of the grading of what they put on their CV of what instrument level they got to, we can then talk to them about that afterwards. But the, the, mo the main instruments we would want to hear um, but I, th I think you just have to kind of have it up your sleeve to be prepared to do of the instruments you play to that standard, uh, you know, a, 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 several pieces for each. And, and you might get asked different shows will ask you to show different skills. So it's worth having it all in your in your back pocket to to be able to bring out, um, you know, f for different for different auditions. Perhaps not surprisingly, we did have a lot of um, questions from drama school students and questions about drama schools and, and colleges. Um, one question from, from Maddie, also a, a GCSA uh, actor musician, is drama school the only way into the industry? And if not, how would you recommend someone without a drama school training to go about entering the profession? That's an interesting, that's a really interesting question. Um, no, it's not a prerequisite to getting into the industry to have a drama school training. Um, and there are examples of people who have entered the profession uh, very successfully without a training. But I think you, and also, you know, there are a lot of drama school, well, quite a lot of drama schools and a, a lot of the drama schools now run a lot of courses. So it's not just about having a training per se, it's about what training each school offers, how good that training is, how good that training is for you, the individual actor, in terms of where you want to develop your skills and strengths. Um, and, and also it's highly competitive, you know, so, you know, getting into drama school is tough. Um, but I do think if you're not going to go to drama school, that you do have to be conscious as a young student actor or a young actor, that there are certain things beyond your talent that you are going to need, particularly for theatre. Again, we're talking about theatre casting now. This might not be the same for TV and film, because on TV and film, of course, you've got the cameraman, you've got the editor, you've got the DOP and the director able to cut the performance 
um, in the way that they want to, to tell the story that they want to tell. In theatre, you're stood on a stage, you're in 360 degrees, you cannot hide, the audience can see all of you all of the time that you're on stage. Um, so the, there is a technique that you, one would hope, you'd come out of drama school with, um, that if you're not going to go to drama school, you, you kind of got to be conscious of how you're going to acquire that technique in other ways. And by technique, I mean vocal technique, really important. Theatre directors and producers always want to know that that actor is going to be able to be heard at the back of the theatre. They don't want any audience complaints about, I couldn't hear him. Um, so there's vocal technique. And at drama school, you do lots, you know, you, you hopefully have a good vocal teacher and you do lots of exercises uh, week in, week out for, you know, months and years. Singing technique, um, movement, uh, scene study, how to break down a script, how to uh, get, you know, build a character through scripts, through scene study. Now, you don't have to go to drama school to get those skills, but you've got to be aware that you're going to need them if you're going to, be, if you're going to have a successful theatre career. Um, so you've got to find other places to get them. And, you know, there's the Actors' Centre in London who do uh, lots of classes. You know, extremely successful vocal coaches of, of past and present, like Cicely Berry and Patsy Rodenberg have written numerous books about with, with, with practical exercises in them for developing vocal technique uh, for actors. You can buy those, do your own exercises at home, but you, that's discipline. You really do need to be disciplined about that. Um, so yeah, you, you have to just be conscious of the fact you're going to have to acquire that ability from some, that, that technical ability from somewhere else if you're not going to get it from drama school. Thank you. Perhaps not surprisingly, we, we also had quite a lot of questions about self-tapes, which have become more and more prevalent within our industry, even before the, the current situation we, we find ourselves in. Um, one question we had uh, was about how good people self-tape needs to be. How long should it be? Is it important to spend lots of money organizing a professional reel or can it be done on a, on a smaller budget? What's, what's your view on that? Well, um, it's an interesting, the whole self-tape issue is very interesting because actually for theatre, um, many of us haven't really wanted to use self-taping that much unless there's an actor you really want the director to um, uh, be able to consider and they're, they're just logistically they cannot meet because the actor is on the other side of the country or the other side of the world working at the time that you're auditioning. Um, and the reason for that is because theatre, the, 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 the theatre and, and filming yourself or being filmed are innately two different disciplines and you respond in your acting differently in a theatre setting than you do in a filming setting um, because the camera is quite unforgiving of anything that seems too large, too over the top, too broad, too theatrical. Um, it wants it to be small. It wants the performance to be very, very contained often. Um, so that's why often theatre directors in the past haven't really been particularly keen to, to, to consider somebody simply off a self-tape. But um, I think it's going to become very much, uh, very prevalent in the months, weeks, months ahead in terms of as and when it becomes clear that theatres can start to reopen. Um, shows are going to have to be cast in advance of that. Um, and I think um, with, a, you know, with the current situation, I think self-taping is going to be a part of the casting process in a much more prevalent way, along with things like you know, Zoom auditioning and stuff like that. Um, what makes a good self-tape? I don't think, I mean, I would have thought it wants to be about three and a half minutes long, three and a half to five minutes, no longer than five minutes. No, I don't think you do need, certainly not to self-tape. You, you, I don't think you do need to spend a lot of money on professional uh, platforms. If you're doing your own showreel, that's, 
that you know it, and, and also it's very good to make sure if you have material that's been filmed of you that you have a good showreel and that you have an up-to-date showreel um but you know there is so much technology available now there's so much you can do online and so much of it uh you know is free or not too expensive i don't think act young actors particularly should feel under any pressure to be spending a lot of money that they don't have on on tapes or showreels. I think you can invest your time, uh, particularly at the moment, in researching how you can do it yourself uh, online. I think that would be my advice. Um, what makes a good show? What makes a good self tape? I would have thought you'd be self taping from the material that you're auditioning for. Like, do you remember Gareth? There were a couple of instances where we had actors we were really interested in him for hay fever who couldn't meet for one reason or another and so we did say yeah fine we'll, we'll look at a show a, 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 a self-tape and then take it from there and so we sent them the scenes that they would have done in the audition room um, and in both cases they recorded those scenes at home and you know a scene means that there are other lines in it and they don't have me reading in with them so you need your your mum or your mom flat or, your or whoever to read in with you and that's also very important that you therefore make sure that you go over the material with them several times they're out of shot obviously but can still be heard and that they're just delivering the lines to you reasonably neutrally just so that you've got something to come to respond to um you you are going to have to just be conscious of the fact that it is a camera whether it's on your phone or on your laptop or a tablet and therefore, we are going to need some sense that, yes, you could stand on a stage and be heard, but you can't be big with it because it's going to read across um, as, as a bit over the top. So you have to judge it. You have to judge your performance in a self-tape uh, uh, to not only respond to the fact that you're auditioning for a theatre show, but that, you'll be, that you're filming it on a medium that wants you to be more low a little bit more low-key than that great and you've touched upon this a, a couple of times in, in your answers at being able to give that sense of theatricality in a film format and we had one specific question that was about how much you want to see interpretations of action and stage direction in a self-tape what, what would your advice be there um i would say I mean, it kind of depends on what the action is required to do, but hopefully you haven't been sent a scene where you're required to have a sword fight with anybody <laughs> or whatever by the casting director or the director. Um, I think my instinct would be play down the stage directions. Don't, don't get too hooked up on all of that. I mean, often when we're reading in, you know, we, we, the director will say, you know, oh, you know, we're, we're not going to pay attention to that stage direction today. You know, it's, it's um, stage directions are helpful because they are an indication of what the writer is trying to tell us about the character and the situation the character's in, but they're not set in stone. And I think because you're doing, you're going to be doing a self take where the camera is pretty close to you it's pretty the frame is pretty contained i would i would i would play i wouldn't i would play down stage directions and action um what you've got to do is what you would do in an audition in a room which is play the truth of the character at every moment um act on the lines and not between the lines and um connect with the emotional truth of what's happening moment by moment in the scene and um, that can be inf your choices can be informed by whatever stage directions or action has been given, but I don't think you necessarily have to replicate them to put across what the character is is experiencing in that in that moment. That's brilliant, Gabrielle. Thank you so much, and I think that that advice is probably the the right note to to finish on. Um, just just before we, we we do leave, though, uh, this is the first of um, a series of activities that you're going to be engaged on with with Water Creative Connects and the next one is an opportunity for actors living locally within 25 miles to submit their self tapes to you and then to have a one-to-one -one conversation about uh, their tapes and just a, a, a general meeting. 
Yes, it'll be fantastic. It'll be wonderful for me to to uh, get to know actors local to to uh, the area. Uh, who I mean, I may know some of them already, but I'm 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 hoping that I'm not going to know some of them, and that it will be a great opportunity to meet new actors, um, and who also you know are are of great interest to Salisbury Playhouse and Wiltshire Creative because that you know they're local, and um, I would. I think we'll give some guidance as to what kind of scene or speech they should self tape. Um, but they should, yeah, it'll, it'll be fantastic to be able to watch that and then have that to talk about, but also any other questions or topics to do with casting or acting that they want to talk about, then we can cover that in the one to one as well. Brilliant. All that information will be on the, on the website shortly. So uh, thank you so much, Gabrielle, for sharing your, your, insight and knowledge and expertise it's, it's been fascinating listening to you and um it's a pleasure it's a total pleasure and it's great I, it's it's a collaborative thing and the, 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 you know it, 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 and the collaboration on this with you with wiltshire creative is a brilliant thing as well so thank you